Father, we thank you that, uh, again, uh, during this season, we celebrate, as believers, we celebrate the reality of the gift of Christ. But Father, also during this season, there's many who celebrate, who have no knowledge of Christ at all. And in the midst of their celebrations, it's a temporary happiness, it's a temporary friendliness, it's a season of good cheer. But Father, help us to grasp this morning how we as believers can truly impact our culture with the reality and the truth of Jesus Christ. And Father, it's in his name we pray. So my question is, is should we boldly claim to that cashier in Walmart, Merry Christmas, instead of Happy Holidays? Are you really taking a, a solid stand for your faith in Jesus Christ when you say Merry Christmas? Is it truly making a statement that, uh, that's mandated by Scripture, or is it even theologically correct? Is there a need for us actually to back up and truly consider that Jesus is the reason for the season? As I shared with you in the opening statement, you're, you're going to have to hold on. You're going to have to buckle in today as I, ex well, as we explore uh, some truths and also some misunderstandings uh, about this time of year. Because we, uh, we, we celebrate this holiday that's called Christmas, and yet at the same time, we want to make certain that we as Christians have a lasting and a powerful impact, a positive impact, on our non-believing family, friends, and neighbors. Some of what's going to be shared today might be new to some of you. Uh, some of you, it's going to be information maybe that you've heard before, and um, maybe you simply filed it away thinking, oh, that's way too controversial for me to deal with, or maybe you think, oh, no, that's just, just really not important. And the fact is, is when you stop and think about it, those two uh, you know, thoughts or ideas, those two statements, one that it's too controversial, I don't want to deal with it, or it's not too important, I'm not going to deal with it. Both of those are two major and opposing understandings of the same statement. The real issue I want us to look at today, is there a problem with trying to put Christ back into Christmas? And I want you to clearly understand, it, it's a weightier question, it's a weightier problem, probably, than some of us have even uh, dared consider. Because you see, the problem actually stems from the fact that all of us, if not nearly every one of us, we have grown up with the celebration that today I'm going to be referring to as Christmas in America. Christmas in America, as a distinct uh, identity of what is being celebrated all around us today. And the fact is, it has little to absolutely nothing to do with the narratives that are given to us from the Gospels according to Matthew and Luke. And even when the culture or even when the church tries to meld together Christmas in America and the message of the Gospels, it usually ends up distorting or certainly leaving out some of the essential portions of the nativity narratives. Personally, I believe that this article, W. David O. Taylor, I'll just call him David Taylor or Taylor, uh, he shares with us kind of a reason for the, for the issue, for the conflict. He says, quote, Christmas in America is influenced less by the stories of a publican and a physician the gospel writers Matthew and Luke, than by the stories of a Puritan, a princess, an author, a poet, and a host of painters. I mean, guys, let, let's un unquote at this point. Let, let's face it, Christmas in America, right now, we could easily leave out all the prophetic pronouncements of the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
we could totally leave out in Christmas in America the narratives of Matthew and Luke. We could leave out the redemptive promises of both the Old and the New Testament. We could completely ignore the fullness of purpose of the physical birth of that babe in the manger. And by and large, we would not miss or even skip a beat when it comes to Black Friday specials or seasonal songs or the lights or the Christmas parade, because when you really stop to think about it, Christmas in America is truly not about the Christ child. It's very much about the jolly old elf and doing good to one another and finding the magic of the Polar Express and trying to live out It's a Wonderful Life and dreaming of a white Christmas. But before you think that I'm trying to be the Grinch that's going to steal Christmas, understand that what I'm moving towards here is to challenge each of us and others that are Christians to realize that we ourselves, we're the ones that have to redefine how we act, how we look, and how we respond to this time of year. As believers, the fact is, is at this point in time, we just need to allow Christmas in America to be what it is. And then as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to learn to celebrate the feast of the nativity. But before we dive deeper into that aspect, let's look a little bit at the history of Christmas in America. It's an event that was not designed by the Holy Spirit. It was not directed by the apostles, but actually by four fundamental influences. The first one, designed by or uh, purposed by or influenced by some legal actions that were taken by the Puritans in the 17th century. Secondly, by some domestic celebrations of Queen Victoria. Thirdly, by the publication of a very popular novel. Anybody want to guess what that novel might be? His name, no, his name was Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. The influence of that, we'll look at that in a moment. And the work actually of poets and painters in the late 19th and 20th century. The earliest known celebration that we have historically of celebrating the birth of Christ was actually in the late AD 200s. And it really didn't catch on very big because there was a lot of confusion of what day that they were actually going to celebrate. And it went all over the map all through the year, primarily just a lot of speculation. Uh, And it actually was a compromise of the church leadership and the timing of some pagan festivals that brought it finally to celebrating uh, Christmas on December 25th. Guys, that's just historical truth that you just need to understand. Don't be blown away about that. It's just the historical truth. And through the years, it's actually morphed multiple times and not always in a good way. But in order to get some of this historical facts laid out correctly, I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be quoting from Mr. Taylor's article quite a bit this morning. And for the time's sake, I may be reading pretty fast here, but understand I've got uh, the the entire thing is going to be available on the sermon notes on, on our website, so you can easily download it and look at it yourself if you miss anything. But Taylor writes that it was around the middle of the 17th century that Puritan leaders in New England made the celebration of Christmas illegal. They did so for two specific reasons. For one, the Feast of Christmas involved a great deal of what they called intemperate behavior. During those long winter nights, people feasted in excess, they got drunk, they engaged in wanton sex, they rioted in the streets, and barged into the homes of the well-to-do and demanded that they be given the best of the pantry. Christmas back then looked more like a frat party gone horribly wrong. It was far from sweet and mild. Another reason the Puritans banned Christmas is that it smelled too much of a Roman Catholic celebration, and the Puritans totally opposed to that. For them, the Roman Catholic Mass of Christ, for the Puritan mind here, disobeyed the requirement to worship only as the Bible has explicitly 
commanded according to the Puritans. The Puritans asserted that the only day to be kept holy was the Sabbath. So now you understand the Puritans had some issues too, okay? One public notice actually warned its citizens that the observation of Christmas having been deemed a sacrilege, the exchanging of gifts and greetings, the dressing in fine clothing, the feasting and similar satanical practices are hereby forbidden, with the offender liable to a fine of five shillings. Now, on the side note, I tried to figure out how much five shillings was worth in today's uh, uh, money. Uh, it's all over the map. The closest I came to is during the 1700s, you could buy a bushel of salt for five shillings. So however that translates today, I don't know, but we'll just throw that out there. Taylor continues, he says, because of the Puritan influence on this particular religious holiday, actually the United States Congress regularly met on Christmas Day from 1789 to 1855. Public schools met on Christmas Day in Boston until 1870. And the first state eventually to declare legal the celebration of Christmas was Alabama, in 1836. Apparently there weren't any Puritans in Alabama, but uh, we'll leave that for another discussion. Taylor continues, one year later in 1837, Princess Victoria, the only daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Kent, became Queen of England. Three years later, she married her first cousin, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. Unlike the English Puritans, German Protestant Christians, like Victoria's mother and Prince Albert's family, retained the historic traditions of Christmas. And because Victoria's ancestors had already introduced the custom of Christmas tree decoration to the English court, it was not a difficult decision for the queen to introduce the Christmas tree to the English people at large. Together, Victoria and Albert modeled for the people of the United Kingdom a family-centered celebration. Now, that's the second key of influence on Christmas in America. As a matter of fact, an entry from Queen Victoria's journal on December 24, 1841, says this, Christmas, I always look upon as a most dear, happy time. Also for Albert, who enjoyed it naturally still more in his happy home, which mine, certainly as a child, was not. It is a pleasure to have this blessed festival associated with one's happiest days. The very smell of the Christmas trees of pleasant memories. End quote. Now, personally, I think that very mindset as it got into America, it uh, was kind of the forerunner, gave birth to um, what we would call modern songs of today, one that you may not think is real modern, but it was a few years ago. You remember Andy Williams' song, The Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Very popular Christmas song, but the problem is, like most of the popular Christmas songs that we have today and that we have had for years, they are totally vacant of any reference to anything having to do with the nativity narratives. But back to Taylor's article again. Taylor writes, quote, As the historian Stephen Nelsonbaum summarizes things in The Battle for Christmas, what was once marked by a liturgical celebration uh, at church and festivities in the village revolving around public rituals and civic activities eventually turned into a domestic affair revolving around a children-centric holiday marked by extravagant gift-giving and in time commercially oriented activities. Six days after, or six years after Victoria ascended to the throne, Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol. With his story, The Ghost of Christmas Past, Present, and Future, Dickens essentially created a myth devoid of any particulars from the gospel narratives. And this is the third and a very huge influence on the American account of Christmas. For Dickens, it was the spirit of Christmas rather than the spirit of Christ that captured his attention. Humanitarianism rather than the humanity of Jesus became for him the final determinative. 
the effect of Dickens' tale cannot be overestimated. As Bowler summarizes it, he revived the most mi- or the lost medieval link between worship and feasting, the nativity and Yule, and emphasized the holiday as a time of personal and social reconciliation. If you remember, Ebenezer Scrooge's, Scrooge's nephew speaks for the era when he remarks, I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The interesting thing Taylor brings to us, during Dickens' day, working on Christmas Day was still a normal thing. But what a Christmas carol did was effectively shame that practice out of use. End of quote. Now once again, for clarity, the idea of Christmas Day being a holiday was simply a humanitarian thought brought on actually by the the popularity of Dickens' novel, uh, having absolutely nothing to do with uh, any type of a spiritual time or celebrating the nativity. It was definitely not considered a holy day. It was simply a commercial holiday. So back to Taylor again. Quote, he says, The final influence on American Christmas is the work of painters, storytellers, and illustrators, beginning with the philanthropist John Pintard in the early 19th century, hoping to inspire the virtuous habits of his Dutch ancestry uh, for the people of New York City. Good luck with that. Uh, Pintard actually campaigned to make St. Nicholas the the patron saint of the city. As Bruce David Forbes describes it in his Uh, book or article, Christmas, A Candid History. He writes, under Pintard's leadership, the New York Historical Society began an annual St. Nicholas Day dinner on December 6, 1810, and for the occasion, Pintard commissioned a woodcut illustrating, or a woodcut illustration of Nicholas clothed in his bishop's robes. So again, a saint in bishop's robes was St. Nicholas. Thus, for all practical reasons, Taylor writes, this would be the last time that artists would represent Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra, in his original liturgical garb. In 1809, on St. Nicholas Day, the writer Washington Irving portrayed St. Nicholas in a satirical book as flying over trees in a horse-pulled wagon and sliding down chimneys to deliver gifts. It was in 1823, some 15 years actually before the crowning of Queen Victoria, that a poem titled A Visit from St. Nicholas, was published, describing St. Nicholas on a sleigh with individually named reindeer. This poem cemented the basic features of the American Christmas story. Taylor goes on to say, another influential figure of this time period is Thomas Nast, a German-born illustrator. In 1862, Nast drew a cartoon for Harper's Weekly that represented St. Nicholas as a small, elf-like creature. Eventually, Nast added other details, locating his headquarters in the North Pole, depicting him as a toy maker with elves as assistants, receiving letters from children and snacks when he visited their homes. A final influence Taylor shares with us that's worthy of mentioning is the illustrator Haddon Sundblom. In 1931, as the Coca-Cola Company chronicles the story, the company wanted its soft drink campaign to show a wholesome, realistic St. Nicholas. So they commissioned Sunbloom to develop a series of images that used Santa Claus, the Americanized version of who the Dutch called Sinterklaas. From 1931 to 1964, Sunbloom produced at least one illustration per year of Santa Claus drinking a Coca-Cola. And it's at this point that Santa Claus went global. 
And according to Bowler, in his book, Santa Claus, A Biography, the overwhelming disbursement of these advertisements ensured that no rival version of Santa could emerge in the North American consciousness. Any ties that may have remained with the humble, benevolent, and Christ-honoring Bishop of Myra in Asia, from Asia Minor were hereafter severed in the American imagination. Nicholas the Wonder Worker had become jolly old Saint Nick. The saint had be fully become secularized, end quote. So in his article here, Taylor calls what was taking place actually a liturgical vacuum. In other words, it's something that the church had started and then pulled away from, and that vacuum was filled, and that's a major issue. He also asks a number of questions, and then he gives us uh, some pretty stark answers to it. So Taylor continues on. He says, so what happens when the Protestant church in the 17th century evacuates its worship of the celebration of Christ's birth? A liturgical vacuum is created that non-ecclesiastical entities willingly fill. The government determines the legal shape of Christmas. The market shapes a society's emotional desires and financial expectations about the holy day. The ideal family replaces the holy family, and the work of visual artists shape their imagination while musicians and writers and filmmakers fill the empty space with their own stories about the magic of Christmas. What happens to the church in the light of all these things? It loses its distinctive voice in the public square. What happens to plenty of Christians, great and small? We get mad about the wrong things. What happens to the gospel stories? They get co-opted by alternative stories or distorted by lesser stories. What happens to the voices of the protagonists Matthew and Luke? They get swamped by the noise of advertising jingles and the voices of fictional characters who invite us to just believe. The reason we can't merely put Christ back into Christmas, Taylor writes, every time we try to put a little more Jesus into the story of Christmas in America, Jesus, as it were, routinely loses. As an instant of civil religion, Christmas in America always aims to sanitize the nativity story, make it safe for public consumption. It robs Luke's story of its sting by removing its scandalous elements. And by placing a crash next to the blown-up Star Wars BB-8 droid or Frosty the Snowman on our front lawns, it absorbs Matthew's strange and even murderous tale into a tale of generic good cheer. Taylor continues on, if it's true that those who tell the stories rule the world, then the story that Christmas in America tells is a juggernaut, a, an overwhelming force, thinking we can throw in a dash of the baby Jesus into the tale of Christmas in America without a mutation of the God-man baby is naive. Believing a shout of Merry Christmas at Target will be heard as a faithful announcement of angelic tidings is equally naive. The story of Matthew the publican and Luke the physician inevitably gets drowned and drowned out. Because the story of Christmas in America is bound up with fundamental American myths like baseball and apple pie, the perfect de or the difficult details of the nativity narratives get swallowed up and repurposed by the nostalgic story of Americans at Christmas time. The most wonderful time of the year 
inevitably reconstitutes the account of the birth of Christ in the days of Herod. And while Christmas in America is not all bad by any means, it involves inertias that resist that more demanding story of God incarnate and to which Christians should be alert, end quote. So now that I've taken the entire service to give you a secular history lesson, what do we do with this? How do we respond to this? You look around you this morning, we've got decorations here, we've got Christmas trees, we've got decorations out in the foyer. You consider maybe all the sweat and the frustrations you yourself, you've, you've already been experiencing during this time of year. You, you yourself, maybe you've already prepared your, your house for Christmas, and now you're wondering if you need to give back that Christmas bonus, or if maybe uh, you need to reject those gifts that somebody's going to be giving you. Maybe you need to go home right now and tear down all the Christmas decorations and remove that blow-up Rudolph from your front lawn. Well, let me encourage you with this, that the first thing you might want to do is to take time alone with your Bible, or better yet, actually a different Bible, a totally different version than what you normally read. Take the time to slowly read through Matthew chapter 1. Don't get hung up on the genealogies, although there's some great stuff in those genealogies. But after you read Matthew chapter 1, flip over to Luke and read Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2, at least up to verse 38. And then from there, skip back over to Matthew and read chapter 2. That puts it kind of in chronological order. Trust me, God's not going to take his love away from you because you're reading the nativity narrative in a, in a modern language or from The Message by Peterson. Uh, instead of reading it through the authorized 1611 King James Version, which none of us could read and none of us could understand anyway. Because you're not studying doctrine here, you're trying to connect with that marvelous wonder of God coming in human flesh. But David Taylor doesn't leave us wondering or wandering either. He also encourages us to consider and to ponder. He reminds us, quote, First, these narratives are amazing, miraculous revelations. When you think about it, it's an angel repeatedly communicating with Joseph through dreams. And in person with Mary and with Zechariah. A host of angels appears to a group of shepherds in their field. A group of astronomers or astrologers, and they were probably a mixture of both. They see a star in the heavens and they decide to visit Bethlehem in order to visit the child king in light of their celestial observations. And then later on, an angel warns them in a dream not to return to Herod. We hear a lot about the magic of Christmas, Taylor shares with us. But what if the magic of Christmas is less like the wonder of a Pixar movie, as wonderful as those are, but it's more like the deep magic of C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia. Far more fantastical than anything we could ever imagine. What would it mean to encounter afresh the awful and awe-filled news of Christ's birth in our festivities? How might we taste anew the terrible and the terrific word of the angels in our testimonies and our prayers? Secondly, Taylor writes, the nativity narratives speak of times of hardship, loss, and pain. A child is conceived out of wedlock. A social stigma accompanies Joseph's decision to take Mary as his wife. Infertility characterizes the experience of Zechariah and Elizabeth. A family become refugees as they move away from home and family at the most inopportune time in order to live among strangers in a foreign land. A savage massacre of children takes place. Suffering haunts every corner of the birth narratives. Pain and loss mark the experiences of each character in these narratives. And so, yes, the celebration of Christmas ought to be a merry celebration of Christ's birth, a marvelous celebration. 
But perhaps Christ's birth is an encounter with joy, not happiness. Because joy, biblically considered, can actually account for suffering and loss, while happiness can't. Taylor tells us, third, it's a multi-generational, multicultural story. Jesus has a teenage mother, and his cousin, once removed, Elizabeth, is advanced in age. Simeon at the temple and Anna the prophetess are decidedly elderly. Mary and Joseph belong to a low socioeconomic class, while Herod belongs to an upper socioeconomic class. The shepherds belong to a social outcast class. Zechariah is the priestly class. The magi are Persian astrologers. And all of these belong to the nativity narrative. However else we may describe the story of Christ's birth, we describe it unfaithfully if we erase all the multis, multi-ethic, multilinguistic, multi-economic, multicultural, and multi-generational. And in being all these things, it actually anticipates the good news we hear of Pentecost, where the Spirit of God brings together a wide host of multis in the name of Christ. So how then shall we live? Taylor recommends two things. First, enjoy in good conscience all that's good about Christmas in America. Enjoy the twinkling lights that dot the neighborhood. Take pleasure in making the sugar cookies and the homemade wreaths. Enjoy these for both personal and missional reasonings. He says, have a good laugh or a good cry by re-watching a Charlie Bound Christmas or the miracle on 34th Street or even It's a Wonderful Life. Listen to your Bing Crosby or Josh Corbin or Mariah Carey records. Enjoy them because the common grace and goodness of God are not absent from these things. Enjoy them because we are always, as Augustine might say, citizens of two cities. Enjoy them because they become a way for us to be wholly present in the lives and the longings of our family, friends, and neighbors. But Taylor also encourages us to remember that the story that Christmas in America tells is not to be confused with the gospel story. While the former makes plenty of room for wonderment and kindly regard for our neighbors, the latter makes it possible for both joy and sorrow, both justice and mercy, to coexist in the redemptive tale of God. End quote. In both the Matthew and the Luke narratives, we see the fullness of God's providential care, as well as the certainty that that, that both men of high standing and, and low standing are equal as they receive the blessings of Christ's incarnation. Those who are lonely, those who are outcasts, share alike with those that are surrounded by family and friends. Joy comes not in the circumstances we live in, but in the certainty of God's unfailing love and the power of the sacrifice of Christ to cleanse us from all sin. To truly know His love and experience His forgiveness as joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm going to ask Jake and the team to come up if you would. David Taylor closes his thoughts out by sharing this last little bit. In the end, he writes, I don't think much good will come from trying to put Christ back into Christmas in America. I say leave that story alone. It's not worth the fight. Let America have its Christmas story. Treat it like any other aspect of our national traditions for better or for worse. 
But I do think a great deal of good will come when the church learns to celebrate the feast of the nativity and to discover in this astonishingly beautiful story of Christ's birth the better than we could have imagined nature of the gospel. I also believe we'd become a lot more winsome witnesses to a watching world that sorely wants to know if God is in fact with us here and now in this time and in this place, end quote. Would you stand with me? Hey, thanks for watching and listening to the current series. We're glad that the Lord is blessing you with this teaching. As you continue on in the teaching of the Word of God in your life, we pray that the Holy Spirit might take that Word, plant it deep within your heart and life, that you might see the fruit of God's love, the reality of His presence, and the power of His Spirit working in your life.